Please welcome to the stage Gilbert Campbell, CEO of Volt Energy Utility. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so if you would have asked me a month ago, would I be in my hometown of Philadelphia where I lived till I was in middle school to talk to you today about best practices for raising a Eagles fan in the Washington, D.C. area, I would say <laughs> you're crazy. Um, but the reality is that's not what I'm here to talk about. But I did have to find some way being home to, uh, to factor in the Eagles in my presentation. And, and the other thing I would say is uh, my voice is a little raspy. I may or may not have been screaming at the game last night. Uh, go birds. But, uh, but in all seriousness, um, the reason that I have my son on here, every morning I wake up, my wife and I in Arlington, Virginia, we count our blessings uh, you know, for, for our son and the environment that he's growing up in. But I also deeply think about kids that look just like him in, in cities and counties all across the country. Oh, I'm sorry, this popped up. <laughs> I was like, did something happen? <laughs> that kids that look just like him in other parts of the, uh, all around this country, that based upon their zip code, have a much higher chance of having things like asthma, mental health issues, potentially being exposed to cancerous type substances and stuff like that. It's just not fair. And so one of the things that you know, I've dedicated the work that I'm doing is really be able to um, mitigate that and address a lot of those issues. But if we're going to move forward, we need to understand what are some of the things that have caused some of these things for kids, like I mentioned, based upon where your zip code is, to be at a higher risk of a lot of environmental health concerns uh, in general. So many of you probably have heard of redlining. But in the 1930s, the home, um, excuse me, the Home Loan Corporation, which was a government-sponsored agency under the New Deal by FDR, decided to look at neighborhoods and determine from a mortgage lending perspective their risk. But it was based off of race and income. And the neighborhoods were listed as green, being the highest neighborhoods that are great for investment. And the neighborhoods listed as red are neighborhoods that were deemed risky and bad for investments. This is a map, as you can see, from Philadelphia from the 1930s. But what you'll see, and it's like this in most major urban city, is that that map really still looks the same. And so when you think about from an environmental justice or environmental health perspective, what communities do you think have had the wrong type of power plants put in their neighborhood, uh, waste treatment plants that are hazardous and things like that? Do you think that they're going into communities that had the green rating? to invest in, or are they going into the communities that had the red rating? The other thing that you'll see, look at Northwest Philadelphia as an example, and it's the same in most cities, that's where you see you have more trees, and trees helps with air pollution. There's a thing called the urban heat island effect where areas where there are not a lot of trees, the, the ground and the cement causes those areas to be a lot higher, I mean, I mean hotter, and so when it's a lot hotter, you're doing what? You have more energy burning, you're paying more for electricity and things like that, it's not right. And so when we're at a point when we're thinking about environmental justice, and I'll just give a quick definition of environmental justice from my perspective, it's the fair and equitable distribution of both environmental benefit and environmental harm. So you think about the type of things that you want in your neighborhoods, trees, bike paths, uh, I'm biased, solar energy, uh, but the things that you don't want, those harmful plants that have CO2 emissions that lead to things like I talked about, asthma and cancer and other things like that. We're at a unique point in our nation's history where, regardless of what happened last week, um, climate change is real. And, and climate change being real and only getting worse, um, we're going to make serious investments as a country, and we already have been in the world, where we're going to see generational wealth creation. And isn't it only fair when we're rethinking through what communities do we invest putting the right type of power plants the right type of infrastructure, trees, parks. Should, it, should we prioritize the areas that we intentionally made sure got a bad shake? I think that most of us in here would agree those are the areas that we really should focus on. So when we hear noise about diversity and equity and inclusion being a bad thing, well, the Great New Deal wasn't great for everyone. And so for those communities that have suffered, let's make sure that we are prioritizing making investments in those communities. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the work that 
a few companies that I started are doing, but more importantly, what can we all do to make sure that kids across this country are living healthy and also given a great opportunity to live the American dream? So, like I said, I grew up in Philadelphia. My dad pastored a church in South Philadelphia. My cousin was more like an uncle, pastor for 30 years in Germantown. So I always understood the importance and the role, particularly the African-American church plays in uh, the black community. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do when I started my first solar company called Volt Energy, where we develop rooftop solar projects for everything but residential, was to go to the church and say, you know what? This particular pastor, Dr. Trent, I think we have a wonderful opportunity to put solar on the church, even though this is a small rooftop, um, it's a visible demonstration for the young people coming in your church, for uh, other members in the church to understand that we're moving towards you know, decarbonization in our, in our country, and this is a great opportunity for them to also understand some of the things that they can do. Little did we know, in 2009, this became the first African American church ever to have solar energy. By far, the lowest margin and smallest project that I've ever done in my life, but the most impactful. Why do I say that? If you, we helped the church establish a green ministry, literally went on Saturdays and helped people understand how to read their utility bills, understand you know, what do kilowatt hours mean, you know, all these different things. For those of, you look at your utility bill, it's like calculus times three, it's almost impossible to read. But by understanding that and understanding what programs were out there in the local community, to reduce your energy burden. How can you do things like energy efficiency work well? We also were pleased, and this was before COVID, where we had youth in the church that would give tours. Tours from, we've had, at that particular church, they've had uh, leaders from other nations across the country. Churches from all denominations wanting to do the same thing. And if you were to go there in the weekend, you'd have anywhere from an eight to a 16 year old explaining how solar energy works and inverters and all these things. So it just shows when you show up in communities, people get it, and it's a way for us to be able to do things to make, to make an impact. And since that, like I said, that led to a lot more churches thinking about how to uh, incorporate not just solar, but energy efficiency and other things to reduce their energy burden and, to be, and reduce their carbon footprint. Another organization is near and dear to my heart. I'm a graduate, proud graduate of Howard University. That's why I said last few weeks have been a little tough. <laughs> um, but also understood the critical role that historically black colleges and universities play in our society. And for the similar reasons to Florida Avenue Baptist Church, I thought it was very important to be able to have a visible demonstration for students to, as they're walking, you know, every day going to class, to be able to see the opportunities in clean energy. And so we put solar on about 13 to 14 buildings all throughout Howard's campus. That's great, put it up, yeah, you know, we make money from doing it, but there's a greater opportunity. What do I mean by greater opportunity? We've literally gone into not just the engineering school and the business, business school, the school of communications, the law school, fine arts. People understand when we're talking about clean energy and the transition, it's not just for engineering and business majors, it's for everyone. We've had multiple students intern, not just with our company, we made it a priority for any subcontractor or consultant to work on this project. You had to make sure that you were gonna engage with students, both through your internships and things like that. Moving on. So, for 15 years, I ran a company developing rooftop solar all across this country. Mostly community-based projects, but we work with large organizations like the Cheesecake Factory, where we put solar at their corporate headquarters in Calabasas. But I wanted to do more. When I said I wanted to do more, I knew that um, the passion I had and the experiences that I learned working in communities, doing projects that had never been done before, how could I do that at scale? Then an opportunity came, sadly, tragically, around the time of the killing of George Floyd. I think we all saw major corporations for the first time making public proclamations to work with diverse companies in their supply chain. One of the areas, and particularly for the tech companies, we're looking at was the procuring of clean energy sources like solar for the large data centers they have in order to account for the AI needs, cloud computing, et cetera. They weren't able, they didn't know of any diverse developers. So they started reaching out to all these organizations that I'm involved with and my name kept coming up. And the first tech company reached out, I won't mention the name, I said I appreciate the opportunity, 
but not set up for that right now. Talk to you if we are. After the third one, I realized my parents didn't raise a fool. And, <laughs> and so there's clearly a need, but I just didn't want to just start a business just from a profitability perspective. Yeah, that's important. I wanted to take what I've learned and how can we take clean electrons to impact real people in real communities. So created this concept called the Environmental Justice Power Purchase Agreement. Not to get too technical, a power purchase agreement is just a way that companies and nonprofits procure solar energy. The environmental justice aspect that was new was I started a foundation called Sharing the Power Foundation. It's a separate 501c3. All of these now have a company called Vote Energy Utility. We're building these large solar farms all throughout rural America, which is great. We're revitalizing all aspects of rural America, which is important because when you think about the just transition and what's fair and equitable, if you're a coal miner and for centuries you risked your life, your family, or you may have suffered from black lung disease to make sure we've all had power. And as we're transitioning away from fossil fuels, rightfully so, we need to make sure we're prioritizing those communities as well. And so that's important. But also what's important is these are large investments and these are large projects being built. When you look in our inner cities, where are you going to find 300 acres in Philadelphia to develop a solar farm? Where am I going to find that in Washington, D.C., or L.A., or Detroit, or Baltimore? You can't. So I wanted to figure out a way that we could work with some great partners, some of these large tech companies and other Fortune 100 corporations, to help them meet their decarbonization goals, but in a way that impacts communities. So through the Environmental Justice PPA, I'll give you an example. We signed an historic deal with Microsoft to develop 250 megawatts, or about $300 million worth of solar for them through that structure, with Microsoft paying a slight premium for that power and 100% of that power going into the Sharing the Power Foundation. We also, as a company, as a young company, I started Volt Energy Utility in 2021, have contributed a million dollars of our own capital into the foundation because it's important that we're making investments in the closest urban area taking the opposite approach of redlining, of looking at those areas that need investments, and we're prioritizing the right type of investments in those communities. And so what you see here is the foundation makes investments in two primary areas. One is providing grants to organizations that are already doing amazing work on the ground. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. One of those organizations is called Gooder, founded by an African-American woman, uh, Jasmine uh, Crow in Atlanta. She identified a problem of food deserts in Atlanta. And so she's been able to address that, but she wanted to develop her first ever mobile grocery store going to areas in Atlanta that were food deserts providing clean uh, food. So the foundation provided a $25,000 grant along with Amazon, Marta, and some other sponsors to help her get her first mobile grocery store. Now she has multiple. And it's just showing you, a, this is from a project that is nowhere near Atlanta, has benefits going into these communities with, with intentionality. The other thing that the foundation focuses on is understanding that, number one, if you're from communities that have dealt with environmental racism, a lot of, mentioned before, a lot of it stemming from redlining, not only should you have the right to believe, excuse me, to breathe clean air and have access to drinking water, but you should be part of this wealth creation opportunity that's happening right now. And so how do we ensure that? Well, I've been in the solar space for 15 years. I can tell you there's a tremendous lack of diversity as it relates to jobs, it's getting better. Um, when you look at business owners like myself, there's not a lot of us. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do is make one of the greatest investments I think you can make is in young people. And we did that by creating a fellowship program starting with students at historically black colleges and universities. We call it the Clean Energy and Environmental Justice Ambassador Fellowship. Real long name, what does it basically do? We take students through the foundation Get them paid internships, whether it's in clean energy, sustainability, or in environmental justice over the summertime. And then on Fridays during their lunch break, we have this thing called Power Fridays. We bring in speakers from industry. We brought in people from the Department of Energy, EPA, to talk about their career paths and stuff like that. But more importantly, when they successfully finish the program, each student gets a $10,000 scholarship. But it comes with some requirement. It means that they have to go back on campus share what they've learned in order to hopefully get more students to think about careers in, in the clean energy and sustainability and environmental justice related space, but also think about how can they impact their local community. And so it's just an example of one 
entrepreneur that had a small solar company doing rooftop solar, but a passion to do bigger impact in our communities that was bold enough to sit in front of one of the largest companies in the world and share my vision and then being receptive to saying, let's do something different. So in closing, what can we collectively do to make sure that we're helping the communities that I mentioned? I think the first thing we can do is have kitchen table conversations about these things. I, I'm guilty of this. We use big words like decarbonization. Just talking about people, especially in under-resourced communities, are using less energy but pay more. Understanding how to read your utility bills. Understanding energy efficiency. Yes, yeah, solar is sexy, but energy efficiency is less expensive and you have a higher impact from doing things like that. Understanding the Inflation Reduction Act, which has wonderful things in it, hopefully most of them won't get repealed, that can be done in communities um, and what, what's in that. And so we all have a vested interest in making sure as we combat climate change, as we make sure we're a wealthy nation, that that wealth is inclusive and all, all able to prosper. So thank you.